Hello, everybody. Um, namaste. Uh, I'm, I work at OpenTable. I work in the developer experience team. Um, we build tools and infrastructure for the other engineers. Um, of course, I love open source and Node building tools and DevOps. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, but before I'm going to start and talking about uh, our use case and what we build and how we uh, deliver uh, micro front ends, um, I think it's like I want to explain you a little bit uh, some background about OpenTable um, so that you understand why what I'm explaining to you today it works well for us. It might not well work for everybody. So it's like it, it's always very unique way when you talk about uh, architecture and way that uh, you deploy in your team to work. So OpenTable is kind of like an old company in the digital age. Um, it's like 20, 20 years old this year. Uh, we are part of the Booking Holdings uh, group. So that's Booking.com, uh, Kayak, Agoda, uh, Rental Cars. Um, we, we kind of like manage all the restaurant reservation part. Uh, we deal with 24 million uh, restaurants reservation per month. Um, we are about 300 engineers. Um, and 50 engineers work on the web part uh, of our infrastructure. Um, also, the engineer, it's also important to know that we have engineering uh, offices scattered around the world. So our headquarters are in San Francisco. I, for example, work in the London office. Uh, we have uh, offices in, in, uh, in, also in India, um, in South America, and so on. And the other part is like we also handle millions of requests uh, per minute on our front end. So the front end still have to perform and handle pretty heavy loads. The agenda, what I'm going to talk about to you, it's like, first, I want to start with the why. So it's like, why micro front ends? It's something that makes sense. What is the problem that we're trying to solve here? Um, and then it's like, what exactly does that mean in practice? Like, behind the scene, what that looks like? And, and then how you can implement something like that uh, in your company, and specifically how we are doing it at OpenTable. And then I will try to not be too long. It's the last talk of the day, and maybe leave some time for Q&A at the end. So if we start for why, an important question is like, uh, this is like it's an African proverb. And say, if you want to go fast, go alone. Uh, if you want to go far, go together. There is something implicit here. It's like, say, maybe we go slower when we go together. Um, and that might be true. So it's like, you know, and uh, this is like it's this, the main reason uh, of micro front end. It's like, how can we go faster uh, together? Um, and if we think about uh, teams, uh, team size, uh, organization structure, complexity, let's say, on the axis, and we look about uh, some kind of like classical architecture that you have. You start with a monolith. It's like, that's super fine. You're super fast if you're alone, if you have one team, uh, because it's like very, very quick uh, iterating loops, uh, not much moving parts. Then the first things that happens, like normally, is like back to front architecture. So you have a back end and a front end split. And then you can go to a microservices. Maybe you have like an aggregation layer in between. And then you have your front end. The, until that part, it's like it's interesting to note that your front end is still a monolithic application. Um, even if you have a microservices architecture in place, more of most of the case, it's like your front end application. It's kind of like a monolithic application. And that's it's where the idea of micro front end came in. How can we do something similar to what we do with the back end with uh, splitting everything into services for the front end? So how can we split into single independent uh, deployable um, units the front end? Ideally, we might want to have something like that where we have a full vertical. Uh, someone else was mentioning today in the various talk that's like ideally you want to have like a front to back single unit where, where the team have an end to end ownership of that feature. It's not just the number of the teams of, of, of the complexity. It's like uh, the principle that's like are being brought to are the same that you have like in microservices. So it's like single responsibility, um, scalability. So you can scale the specific part of the front end differently. Autonomy, so it's like, how can you develop, test, and deploy that part of the front end completely independently from the other teams? And how maybe, how can you use different technology? How can you use part of a front end using maybe a framework and a part using another one? 
And I think it's like the last two points are what I think it's like are way more uh, important to front end. So it's like different technology, the front end, it's like it's evolving at a very, very fast pace. Uh, everybody now maybe want to move to React or Vue, and like, you know, in a couple of years from now will be the same, maybe to work the same, a couple of years ago was the same to Angular. So it's like, it's, it's very hard when you have a lot and a big front end with a lot of team working to have a unified code base, because you, you will never go and rewrite stuff, um, because maybe it, there is no need for that. Also, one thing that maybe I think it's like, uh, it's important to notice, it's like the, the structure, the one that we saw before, um, the whole structure, this is like are also very, very representative of what it's called as like as a, as a Conway node. So it's like these tend to map very close to how the organization of your company looks like. Um, and I will tell you why we came and we start in that way and why we arrive all in this structure. It's a very, very interesting uh, process because it's like it starts from some pain and some urgency that developer had around how the company was organized. So to summarize, it's like the idea behind Microfrontend, it's like it's really to enable multiple teams to work together um, and help them to kind of like have an end-to-end -end ownership and make, be able to independent test, develop, and deploy part of the, the features that are built. Uh, so you could have like a team that maybe it's a search, it just need to deploy the search box, for example, uh, without having to worry about how the navigation is handled, what's, what's the footer looks like, what about the header. They just need to be able to deploy that specific part of the front. But while this makes sense, it's like in, in a broader term, what does it mean in practice? So if we have like, let's say that we have three, three parts of our page, like just starting with a very, very simple example. Uh, this page could be like, let's say that I have a header, we have like page content with, with our stuff and we have a foot. And let's say that it's like this, we want to have three teams working on that independently um, without having to redeploy the full front end every time we do a change on the footer, for example. Well, the first part will be to try to have some kind of way so that like those are served by a service. So it's like, you know, the header will be come from a service that will serve the header, the page, and the footer. So it's like, didn't mean it's like they will be served at runtime, and, and we don't have to need to worry about how we compose. One, one problem with this approach, and this is like was uh, how we started initially, um, we started experimenting with micro frontend almost four years ago, so it's like we've been doing that since quite a while. Um, this is what we started off uh, similar. It didn't exactly look like that, but like that's the idea. Uh, one of the problems with this is that um, you don't have any way to handle um, breaking changes. Because what if the header team deploy a header that's actually is going to break uh, my page? Um, so what you want to also to have is to, to have a way for version. So it's like you want to make sure that's like uh, the components that you get, you can get to a specific version. My, you can even lock it to minor or major, depending on the cases. But that's also something that is very important when you're talking about runtime. So the difference here mainly is like it's it's a switch of mindsets. Like normally when you build your front end, you do everything at like at build time, and then you deploy those build front end that like get served down to your to your clients. Uh, in this case, it's like all those parts are consumed at the runtime. And so it's like you need to be very careful of breaking changes. This can be solved, technically can be solved in various ways. So it's like one way for achieving this could be iframe. One could be using Ajax and it's like loading those parts dynamically. The other is like it's, it's, it's software. For example, there is a server, server side includes, uh, or varnish have edge size includes. There are various ways of software that allows you to do this integration. Um, we built our own kind of software. Um, it's an open source uh, project. It's called Open Components. And I'm going to tell you a little bit how it's composing its, its structure. It's, it's composite about few tools, some, some platform that you can run as an infrastructure. So it's a little bit complex uh, as, a, as, a, as a screen, but we go through all the screen, the, all the pieces. The central part is what we call the registry. The registry is like it's a runtime registry. It's in charge of like serving your components and also publishing your components. It's like a, a REST API 
uh, for those components, uh, where each component have its own endpoint, and each component has version if on the endpoints, and it's in charge of a few things. Then we have a CLI, CLI tool. CLI tool is very important. It allows developers to build a uh, bootstrap and couple very quickly some components. It allows to publish and to run a dev, locally dev uh, environment for the registry for, for working on it. Um, and also you can use it in CI for automating uh, all the release and stuff. So mainly we never publish through the CLI. We, we, we always publish through CI. All, all the assets, like for your component, those get stored uh, on a CDN. Um, the CDN, it's like can be anything. Uh, we rely on S3, but we have uh, a system that's like Hermes, we call storage adapter, that uh, we provide the one also for Google Cloud, and you can build your own. Uh, it's pretty easy to build one. So main, you can you can host uh, the assets uh, for your components wherever you want. Uh, the same is like it's it's similar to the templating system. One problem when you run a registry for for front end component, it's like that you want you don't want to be locked in 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 the technology that you're building your component for. So like maybe yesterday we were using Jade, Tag, then Handlebars, then React. So how we can keep is evolving. So we have what we call a template system. Um, and uh, that again can support any kind of framework you like. Um, the template system consists of two packages. One is a compiler that is used by the CLI to package all your assets together. And one is like it's a very, very lightweight uh, package that is used by the registry to kind of like be able to render this component. Um, so mainly you can incorporate in this component all your opinion, how you would like build the front ends, like for example, we decided to use React lately. We're using uh, CSS modules for, for handling the CSS. So like you can encapsulate all of these in your kind of like template. And you can have multiple of them. You can even have different teams have their own kind of templates and they work seamlessly together. So like the boot is and it's agnostic. It's like and we will see after in a demo how that looks like. Then I forget one part. It's like the client library. Um, here I just there are a couple of options, but there are many more developed for for open components. There is like also Ruby uh, and others. The idea is like uh, those are library that can interrupt with the registry and consume this component. Uh, so for example, the very very simple one that I think is like super easy to understand. It's like the JavaScript library. So it's like let's say that you want to do a client side rendering, you need to have this little library. Uh, loaded and this will allow you to kind of like handle all the different components and orchestrate how, how this will work. Um, while you are doing something like maybe at a server level where you are going to assemble and doing UI composition, then you want to use one of the other libraries, for example, a PHP library or a node library. And this is like it's interesting because you can do uh, caching also at a library level and you can also do um, batch requests. So like let's say that you need and 20 components to assemble together in a page, you, you just do that in a single request. Another little things like maybe that I haven't mentioned, it's like what are components? What are the components that you put on the on the right? But components like are just universal pieces of JavaScript HTML. We try to stick on, on, on universal because that's like the default thing. So like when we build a template, uh, specifically we want this component to work, uh, on the server, on the client so that we can do server side render for all our pages. Uh, so like the registry handles both server side and can default to client side rendering for any component within any approach. So. To tell you a little bit, like a little bit, what happened, so you can understand how we how we put together this uh, this infrastructure. It's let's say that you click uh, opentable.com slash San Francisco restaurants. The first things that you will eat will eat our front door. So like this is like it's just a load balancer with like uh, all the things that you need, like discovery services, and this is let's say okay, it means that I'm looking for a microsite. That's how we call it. Looking for star, the it's called star, the metro is San Francisco, and this read directly internally in our infrastructure. Um, if you're interested, we run on Mesos, the full infrastructure. Um, the, 
to 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 an instance of that start microsite, and we pass in some some queries parameters here. And this is like we say, okay, it will give it to the start microsite, and that will send up that to page. That kind of like architecture where we have this very independent website, it's like because we started uh, breaking the monolith uh, a few years ago. And so it's like how we went, we went in, into a way of slicing them vertically. So let's say, oh, we have a star page, we have a search result page, we have a restaurant page. And so we created some very small team uh, that built the front to back kind of like mini website for that. And they were very independent and agile and very, very fast in moving forward. And that allowed us to break the, um, the monolith pretty quick and pretty fast. And out of that, we also create microservices behind the scenes. But that's at one problem. Um, and it's like, and the problem was like that all of those sites maybe had some shared thought. So for example, think of a header, think of a footer. It's like exactly the same. And doing for us, like that we're the team working on, on those shared components. It was like really, really hard to do a PR because it's like we need to do a PR in multiple repos. And maybe it's like, uh, we were based in London. Maybe some of the team were in San Francisco. We have to wait the day after for reviewing the PR. So it's like also orchestrating how we were going to deploy that. It's like it was, it was very, very hard because we were to manage a different time zone, orchestrate that. And that was really frustrating. So in the keynote this morning, there was like, uh, this mention about how if you want to change a system, it's like if you want to bring change, you need urgency. And it's like this for us was like really urgent. It's like more than urgency, this was really pain. So it's like, and that's where we started thinking about, um, what now it's called micro content as a pattern. It's like, how can we deliver to independently without having to wake up the team in San Francisco without having to, to synchronize with that. So mainly what will happen is like that behind the scene, this is very simplified, but behind the scene, uh, the start microsite will, will do a call on our component registry and get the component and then serve it down uh, to the rest. Where slightly that grows a little bit out of control during the, um, the breaking of the monolith approach. And we, we ended up with 22 microsites and more. So it's like it, it's, it's, now it's, we are thinking about how can we reduce that and go to something like, you know, more stain to, to maintain. Um, so this is like where we are moving forward towards. Like, same similar things, uh, but we are calling a specific call site that we, internally we call the Lego. And what we do, we say, well, Lego, this is like, it need a page start. And then it call all the components that need and it serves it. What we made, we transform that page that need a full site into a slightly bigger component. Uh, but that actually, that's what was between the two and that. And so, uh, this is allowing us to experiment with, for example, um, canary releases. So like when we do a release, we slowly pass traffic to the new version because it's like this, we can pick the latest version, for example, of the page component. You see that it's been deployed. And then we serve maybe 10%. And then we check about regression in real time with, for example, JavaScript errors, how, how conversion are going live. If nothing, if there is no regression, then we move on. It's like maybe we serve more until we have a full uh, deployment. So I want to give you a little demo so you can understand a little bit how it looks like a component, which are the parts, how it's working with them. Um, because of technical reason for internet, I'm not going to do install npm packages here live on stage. So, but if you want to do it, you can just do npm uh, i install it globally if you like, and say oc. Oc is like a component. So if you if you hear me saying oc during the call, it means that I'm referring to a component. So, what uh, what happened when you What you can do is like, uh, on, when you have a FTLI available, you can of course ask some, some, some documentation, some comments that are there, but you can use it to initialize your component. So, for example, you say OC init, you say the name of the component that you want to initialize, and then you can pass a, um, the name of the template that you're doing. The template is nothing else that a, as you see, 
it will try to install the OC template React compiler. Because like there is this convention that each template is a compiler. And this is what the CLI use to package your application. And it will just fetch it from, from the public NPM. So you can create your own template very easily and just publish on NPM. And then everybody can just do in it with that template and it will scaffold and have like a good CLI working with that specific type of component. I think this is going to take a little bit while. Um, because I did it in single car, also the, the connection was done. But yeah, so it's like mainly, uh, this is like the idea that we bought. Uh, in the last two years, we've been working on this uh, abstraction over uh, the, the technology you build your front end. And this is working really, really, really nicely. Also, the idea that with the couple, a compiler from the the other part of the template that is the renderer allows us, for example, to keep evolving the compiler. For example, let's say some people, oh, we want to do CSS in this way, but maybe we want to package and, and organize the web pack a little bit different. We can keep deploying that without having to alter what we deploy on the register, as long as it's not a breaking change for the rest. And so we will see, we'll tell you success, you create your first component and you have some uh, command that you can run uh, to start. Um, I did it, and I think I have it here. So what you have what you have in a component, um, here we created like another component, it's like, first of all, it's like it's a manifest. So if we, if we look at the package JSON, it's, it's big enough for everybody to read it, or should I do more? Okay. So, we see this the normal stuff, like we have a name, we can add a description, a version. Then we have like a specific OC part where we configure the, the, the part related to the open component. And there are a couple of things. One is like the file. So here we say that we have a data uh, entry that points to a server JS. We will see why it's there, because that sounds weird, I think. If, if you're now like, wow, we are doing a front end, what is a server JS there? We will, we will talk about it. And then you have a template and say, okay, this is the entry point for my, in this case, would be a React, probably application. And the type, you need to say that it's also template React. It already has a dev dependency, the compiler that we say. And this is like it's similar if you have used Create React App or other tools that try to have a very, very minimal configuration. Uh, if we need to update teams with new features, they can just update the React compiler and the, the application will automatically benefit from the new feature. Um, and then you have some parameters. So because on the registry, your component, when we publish, we will have an endpoint, you can also have query param to that endpoint. Um, and that means that like, uh, you can do, here we can specify some documentation. For example, you can say, okay, we have a name parameter, parameter that we can uh, pass it. Uh, you have a default, you can pass in description. Uh, and this is used for some server side uh, validation. Uh, when we're going for it, that we do that automatically. But I want to touch back, well, we can look at what's happening. It's like a very, very simple uh, React application. It's just uh, print the name that we pass in and do some CSS. It's nothing fancy. Um, then we have the CSS. Again, it's like very, very simple. Um, but the, the point is like, why do we have a server JS? in our front-end component. And I think this is like it's the unique part uh, of, of our solution, of our open component. Because one of the parts uh, that still a problem is like front-end is always a dependency of the event. So it's like no matter what you're doing, there, there will be always some change. Maybe you want to do some A-B test. What if we change some data that we are sending? So to do that, then you need to talk with your uh, with the backend team or the services and you do a PR there. You need to work at create a change. It's not that autonomous anymore. So we thought about, well, why not using a uh, serverless function? So it's like, these are like actually our serverless function. If I open it, you will see it's export a function. Uh, you accept some context and then you will call, you call a callback. So this is a, this is a thing. And in there is like you have access, for example, to the, to the query parameter. Uh, this is very similar API to what like Lambda in AWS does. And what happens, it's like we will call this function, uh, we, we will 
this, because run on your private infrastructure, it can have easily access to all your private infrastructure. Um, because also, for example, on S3, on cloud, you can also mark it as private. So that file is not available publicly. And so you are safe to do stuff on your private infrastructure here and without having even to expose a single API endpoint. For example, one thing that we do, we use GraphQL as aggregation layer, uh, but we don't want to expose a GraphQL endpoint. So what we do at this point, we can kind of like just use this as a proxy. It's kind of like your API gateway. The interesting part is like whenever you are deploying, there is a match in version 1.1 one, one with API and the component. So it's like, let's say that I'm releasing a component version 2 where I change stuff in the in the server, it, the older consumer of the other component won't change. The version 1 will still use version 1 of its own API uh, because it's been uh, bundled together and published on the registry together. So this is like, it's the unique part uh, of OP component. So what we can do here, we can run, for example, a dev registry. So to see how it looks like. So the command is simple, the dev, and then where you want to run it. And look, you see, created a packages folder, because it's like it's packaging this folder. This is what will be then published to the registry. Um, when you're locally, maybe it's not optimized. If we go to, to the localhost, this is like our uh, registry endpoint. And so we see that we have like a header component, and it's a version 1.0. Uh, what you will normally have, because now we just created, you will have a list of all uh, the version published. So you can change that version, look back if you change something in the documentation, and really see how it is, because it's like every, it's like it's all the components are in new Whenever it's like it's published, it, it's like it's never break. Everybody can still consume that version. That's because it's a runtime system. You don't want to break um, contract. And so you see that's like we created some very basic documentation out of it, like the parameters and name. Um, this is like it's how the endpoint will look like. Uh, of course, it's like this is like it's some versions. Like we can also do something like that if you will return at the minor version, the latest minor version. And then this is like here we have like a um, a preview of the component, so we can also see the full component in preview mode here. Okay. And so what you see is like let's say we do. So like this point, we are changing the model that we are serving from the uh, from our uh, oh from our serverless function, and we see it like in, in real time, like how this is reflected. What is happening on the preview pane that it's like client side rent. So it's like we are fetching the component, we are doing a call uh, for the for the data, and then we are doing a client side rent. And but if you if you just hit the endpoint of the component, the default will be a server-side render. So this is server-side rendering of that component uh, automatically. And that means that like everybody can compose tools uh, in any part and all the components support server-side rendering. How do we, let's say that we have this component, and let's say that we publish. We cannot do that during the demo because the internet is very weak, but for doing publishing mainly, as you say that I did OC dev, you will do OC publish. Uh, you will have, you will need to have a, a URL for your registry and be able that to have access to the publish on the registry and that the component is there and available immediately to everybody uh, that, that has access to the registry. But how do we, Implement this in a website. They say that we are the component, we are the teams, we created this component. Um, also, every team can add 
new component to the registry whenever they want. They don't need to ask anybody. They don't need to ask a, a server admin, infrastructure, operation, DevOps. It's like they just create a new component, publish it, and it's available for everybody. Uh, at that point, there is a contract that you need to establish for consumers. So let's say that you want to integrate your component in your website. Um, what you're going to do for a client-side rendering will be something very, very simple. Yeah, we use custom tags, so you will use, say, okay, these are like OC components, uh, the URL of the registry, the name of the component, again, the version, let's say that we want to lock it to them, to the version one, and let, get always have the latest, my, latest minor of version one. And then we add the, the client side, um, library. And this is like, it's everything you need for having your component working. So what you see in the preview is exactly what happened in behind the scenes is, is exactly this. What about server-side rendering? So for example, here we have like a node example. Uh, you require the, the client in skateboard node. Uh, you instantiate it. Uh, some stuff that you can do when you instantiate it, you can also um, warm up specific components. So those will be cached automatically on instantiation uh, on the client. Uh, by cache means that like, for example, all the component will be automatically cached in memory there. So when, when it will ask for a rendering, the only thing that will, will call will be the function. It will get the data and it will do, uh, the, the server side rendering at that part in time. So like the every load is not on the right. Here it's like we are doing a client render component. We say which component we have and then we get back the render HTML. We can also pass an option with parameters. Uh, headers, whatever we need to pass, we can pass. This is like as a single component. You have also the render component, that is like the batch uh, endpoint, so you can have multiple components uh, in one shot. So, the thing is like, we started using this on websites. So it's like, multiple parts of our web infrastructure at OpenTable, it's uh, handled as, um, as open components. And the teams I independently deploy part of the front end. For example, the header actually is a component and, and many of them. We have, we have, I think it's like over 200 components on the register. But the, the point is like, we say, what we can we use it for? Before? So for example, this is an email. And if you think about an email, well, it's like, it's, it's a bunch of components. Um, and so it's like, that's how we are also using the registry. Like we have a team that actually is building component for all our um, transactional email. And because of that, they can compose the email as much as they like. They can do A-B tests and they can do that. Like, you know, every time email sent out, the template compiled to fetching the, the email from the registry. The other more obvious way is for external widgets. So it's like, you know, now every restaurant is like by just adding that script website as it's have our widget. And that means that we can deploy an all those people website where we don't know nothing about it and uh, autonomy. I also wanted to show a little bit about some tools that we have when we build it. So for example we have a Chrome tool uh, that you can see in the back. What it allows is to show it will see all the components that are running on the page. Um, you can select it. For each component you can also choose all the versions. And when you click one, it will switch that version in your production site. Uh, so because it's like it will kind of like get this component and re-render it client side in this uh in this side. And you can also pass all the properties that this component is attacking. So for example, here we are changing uh the translation to Japanese, and you see that like it it gets. Also you can switch to local. And this is like it's pretty amazing because what you can do when you switch to local. I mean, you say, well, this component, I want it from a dev local registry. In that you can have your production website running, and then you just fetch that specific part of the front end from your local registry. And you can kind of like live, real live, live, live work on this. In, wow, work on that in real life. Um, and so people are like often asking, who else is using Open Components production? Uh, so, of course, as, as we started, Skyscanner uh, uses Open Production, Cisco, Chegg, and other companies started to use this in production. 
um, for for just giving some some numbers of so like you know the the registry that uh, my teams like handle for all the components infrastructure at open table it's kind of like serve about five billion components a month um and all the team that handle that infrastructure and plus the framework and everything and tools it's a team of people so we are just two on that so like it scaled pretty well and we never had like two major accidents it's like it it, it, it worked very well for, for that So this is like I wanted to, to to try to make it a little bit short so that maybe we can have a little bit conversation and question about it. Um, and thank you very well. Thank you very much for for, for attending. How do you tackle these things? Can, can you repeat with the mic? Like, how do you tackle like CSS problem when it comes to like you? All your micro front ends have to be like super responsive because, like, I can share it between different websites, right? If I have a micro front end. Yes. Yeah, so it's like uh, one is like uh, when you build your compiler in the template, there is where where you really want to do a lot of work to so make sure that like you know the team doesn't have to care about this. Thing. But with the Duke CSS, it's like we do everything, it's like, you know, for making sure that we serve the most, uh, efficient, uh, application. Um, for sharing stuff, we try to make sure that components are encapsulated as much as possible. Because as long, as soon as you start to have a dependency from something else, then, then you have a problem. Um, if, with, with, if you try to keep this as small for the moment it's working, the next challenges that we will have to face is like probably how can we optimize shared dependency? Um, that that is like it's an art problem. Yeah. But also, like when you start creating these different components, right? Like, like a say component. Like, how, how do you like share data between them? Like, I click on this button, but then I have a different micro component that that needs to react now. Right? Yes. So like, normally so you do that through events. So events, like you know, okay. yes. So you do a lot of event event listeners you add all these event listeners yes so you, you you create your event pass and then like you know and then you communicate to that right so any examples of like where oc is being used for mobile apps because uh, we constantly look at like serving our like serving the end users without having them to install the app again right they have one installed app and then we but we want to rapidly change our content the challenge with the mobile app is being that they have to download it again and again. It's, it's a monolithic app, right? Yeah. So you mean using web views inside the like exactly app. like is, will will this be a good? We never tried, so we yeah. never experienced with that. I think it would be definitely interesting uh, trying it out and maybe have like a prototype. It would be interesting. I I cannot tell you about it because we never we never tried that. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's what I was kind of. <laughs> 